Hello, I'm Matthew Weinstock, Managing Editor of Modern Healthcare. Thank you for tuning in to the latest edition of The Checkup. New Jersey is one of it, has been one of the states that's been hardest hit by COVID-19. Hackensack Meridian Health, a large health system there, has been using the experience during the early stages of the pandemic to prepare for what's coming next. I'm joined today by the system CEO, Bob Garrett, to talk about some of those lessons learned and challenges that may lie ahead. Bob, thank you so much for taking time with us. We know it's a, it's a very busy schedule for you, so we appreciate you taking some time out. Thank you for having me, Matt. So I guess first, uh, give us an, uh, a broad over sense of how Hackensack was hit during the early stages of the pandemic. And even now, um, like I said, I think a lot of people were aware that New Jersey was pretty hard hit in the early stages, but give us a sense of where you are now. Yeah, so, you know, truly uh, we were hard hit. We were the uh, early epicenter of this uh, pandemic. And uh, when I look back at it, we've uh, we've treated um, about 10,000 um, COVID patients throughout our network, which is really an incredible, astonishing number. At the peak, uh, which was actually April 13th for our health network, uh, we were at about 3,000 COVID-19 uh, patients. Today, as I'm speaking to you, we're actually under 70. Uh, patients through 17 hospitals and uh, over 10, 10 or 11 uh, long-term care facilities. So we've come down a significant uh, amount. I think, uh, you know, a lot of credit goes to, you know, our healthcare workers, to our team members, but also to the state of New Jersey as well in terms of how they've managed this. Uh, I think people have been following the social distancing. They've been masking. Uh, we've been outspoken about those uh, those issues ourselves as public advocates. Uh, but I think by and large, um, the state has done a really nice job in uh, in managing this. Considering we were early hit, we didn't have a lot of the tools that, you know, that are available uh, today. And we, you know, literally had to scramble uh, very, very early on. Right. And, and I do want to unpack a few of those things, but you, you touched on masking. And I do real quickly want to talk about that because it has become so politicized, um, mm -hmm. you know, to mask, to not to mask, all these things that we're seeing across the country. And now we're seeing the AHA, the American Hospital Association, AMA and others, you know, being public about it. You said you've been very public about it. How did you do that with your community and how did you talk about masking and social distancing? So we, um, I, first of all, I did a, um, an op-ed piece about the benefits of masking. And I basically said uh, it shouldn't be political. Um, there should be no question here. It, it not only, you know, has been proven to prevent the spread of, uh, of the virus, but actually even when particles of the virus have gotten through the mask, um, the cases that, um, that we've seen have been um, less because um, it, it blocks out many of the uh, particles. So people aren't getting as sick as they, um, they, um, they would have gotten if it wasn't for the mask. We've also been, you know, on the airways, we, we've uh, done public service uh, announcements. We've been educating our, um, our team members. We have uh, weekly uh, virtual town hall meetings. We've had webinars. Um, and, you know, we, we try to uh, bring, you know, evidence-based um, um, data to the, to the table. But there's no question that, uh, that masking has been a, a really effective tool. As a matter of fact, Hackensack Meridian was the uh, first um, health network in the entire region to um, require universal masking for our team members, for our physicians, um, as well as our patients. And even after visitors returned, uh, they, they, are, they were masked uh, from the very, very beginning. So we felt it was an important tool. And um, honestly, I, I don't think there should be at this point um, any political argument about it. It, it, it is effective. Um, I, you know, I know it's inconvenient and uh, none of us wanna wear masks, uh, but you know, in, uh, if we're around people, particularly in indoor uh, spaces, um, it's really essential. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's interesting that you've been doing it for so long. And I think that feeds into this next question I was wanted to talk to you about, which is the playbook that you're developing for, you know, COVID 2.0 or whatever mm -hmm. you're, you're calling it. So describe for the audience what that is and how you're deploying that across the system. Yeah, so you know, as you said before, you know, we were uh, we were early in this uh, in this uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. So what we've done is documented a lot of uh, lessons learned. Um, we actually have developed a, an actual playbook. We have over thirty chapters that have been um, have been completed, and those are things such as uh, you know emergency preparedness, um, how to 
how to increase capacity, you know, and on very, very short uh, notice. You know, during the during the uh, height of the COVID uh, crisis, as an example, our flagship hospital, Hackensack University Medical Center, within a matter of just a couple of days, had to actually take their entire cafeteria space, which was really huge space, and convert it into a 72-bed COVID uh, unit. Uh, in a matter of days, so you know, so capacity was uh, was was a lesson learned in terms of what what needed to be done, and so we're putting plans in to be prepared for COVID 2.0. Uh, also, staffing, you know, was a was a big issue. If you're going to increase capacity, you know, we need to we need to source uh, staffing, and also, you know, a lot's been written about this, but certainly supplies and PPE. You know, a lot of lessons learned there. What worked, what didn't work. You know, we literally had a had a source PPE around the globe, and you know what we're learning now is number one, we're we're able to stockpile for a potential 2.0, and uh, right now we we have um, you know close to 90 days uh, worth of uh, PPE supply. We're trying to build that up to 180 days by uh, by the fall, and in some in some aspects we're we're getting very close to that, but um, but also uh, just having to source um, PPE around the globe was very, very challenging. So we're, we're trying to um, form new partnerships to be sure that uh, we can get domestic sources of, uh, of PPE in the future. So that's just another example. We also uh, have a chapter written about testing and how to uh, ramp up our testing capacity. And one of the things we're doing there, Matt, is we're uh, entering into a private-public partnership with the state of New Jersey. There are some federal funds that each state has uh, received to expand testing. And in New Jersey, uh, they felt that, um, which I, I think is the right way to go, they felt the, the way to go was to partner with hospitals and health systems because we have laboratory facilities. And if we can put additional equipment in to really be able to ramp up our testing, it's it's probably going to be an effective way to be able to, uh, to treat COVID if there is another surge. Have you run into, on the testing front, have you run into supply shortages there? We recently talked to uh, Jim Scogsberg from Advocate Aurora in Illinois, Wisconsin. They've had problems with the reagents and being able to get some of that into their facilities. So has that been a problem for you? It has been a, a problem on and off. Um, so I agree with his comments. I think reagents have been uh, challenging. But we have uh, we have partnerships with, uh, with uh, some of the commercial mm -hmm. laboratories, but we've also developed our own internal test, which really proved to be a game changer early on in the pandemic. Uh, it's a rapid test. It was developed by our Center for Discovery and Innovation. And the, the best way I would put it, Matt, is it was it took the best of two worlds, the best of the CDC test and the best of the World Health Organization test and put it together. And back in the early days of the pandemic, uh, there were there wasn't much testing um, capacity at all from the commercial laboratories. And we were able to literally test patients and get results back within within hours. So we've been fortunate that we've been able to do more of this um, more of this internally, but still I would say reagents and testing capacity continue to be to be a struggle. Uh, we're, you know, we're constantly um, striving for quick results, even even when we have to send out the lab specimens to the commercial laboratories, we like, you know, 24 hour to 48 hour results. Sometimes that's been possible. Other times, you know, that slips to, to several days and, and, and even a week at, uh, at, at times during this pandemic. So um, it has been unsteady, but we think with this public private partnership that, that, uh, that the uh, New Jersey Department of Health and the governor's office have endorsed that uh, that will give hospital laboratories a real ability to increase their capacity and also uh, hopefully have access to reagents as well. Got it. And, and sort of lastly on this front, uh, Bob, on the PPE side, you said you're stockpiling, you're building up your reserves. We are hearing still from physician practices and others that they're struggling with supplies. So how do you balance your needs to be ready for a second wave versus what we're hearing across the industry that there are still some shortage issues? issues yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's a that's a it's a great question. Um, and, you know, listen, we, we you know, we were the recipient of, uh, of ventilators and of PPE early on in the uh, crisis from other parts of the uh, the nation. And, you know, we are reciprocating um, as well because, um, you know, we want to we obviously want to be prepared for the fall and the winter in terms of an, another surge. But our colleagues out there, uh, particularly with some of the uh, the newer hotspot states, if you will, they need they need our help. So uh, we are reciprocating. Listen, we're we're one industry. Um, it's all about um, it's all about patient care. It's about saving lives, and uh, we've been. 
we've been trying to do our share. But you're absolutely right. It is a balance because, you know, you still want to keep an inventory on hand because there are models that are showing that it is going to come back in, in New Jersey in greater numbers. So we don't want to totally deplete our, our reserves, but we uh, wherever we can, we uh, we try to help other hospitals, health systems, phys physicians, offices as well. Right. OK. Uh, and also here, you're not unique in this situation, but you have had some instances where you've had some staff who contracted COVID. There's been some concern among the frontline staff that they're not getting the protection, not just at Hackensack, but elsewhere, you know, that they're not getting protection that they need. You know, as you think about that playbook you're developing, how do you respond to those critiques and what have you learned about being able to, to work with your frontline staff going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, the biggest difference going forward is that the I don't believe there'll be as many changes in terms of the CDC guidelines. Literally, as we were in the midst of this crisis, sometimes those guidelines would change two, three, four times a day. So it was very difficult in terms of you know what what was appropriate to reuse PPE, what was not appropriate to 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 use PPE. So I think that the guidelines have been you know become more standardized now, and I think there's a there's a growing consensus as to how PPE should be uh, should be used. Yeah, I mean, look, look at I mean, I, I can't say enough about our frontline caregivers. They were um, they were just amazing. Matter of fact, today uh, I just came from um, from two events where today is Remembrance Day at Hackensack Meridian Health. Um, sadly, we lost uh, 21 team members to uh, to COVID-19 um, during this uh, during this pandemic. And uh, as a nation, we haven't had an opportunity to really grieve because, um, you know, we're still in the midst of this pandemic. We thought it was important to celebrate the lives of those that we lost and to make sure that we never forget their contributions that they made. But, you know, I have to tell you, there there isn't a meeting that goes by. There's not a day that goes by that, you know, we're not. Um, concerned with uh, and putting our team members uh, first in terms of their protection and, of course, our patients' protection, too. I just feel that, um, again, going back to the playbook, that, you know, we'll, we'll have a much more, um, uh, you know, balanced and, and steady um, state going forward as far as uh, the guidance on, on PPE. And also, you know, with this lull or somewhat of a lull that we're seeing now, it gives us a chance to catch our breath and to do that stockpiling so that, that we won't have to scramble and literally, you know, wait for a, a shipment of face masks to come in from China or somewhere else overseas. Right. And and condolences on the loss of your team members. I know that can't be easy for you and the, the whole Thank team. You. So Thank you. It was um, very, uh, very, very special, uh, meaningful day for, uh, for all of us. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, you know, one of the other parts of your system that that obviously is dealing with this in, in severe manners is that nursing home front. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing there? I think you've hired additionally on that on that front, right? But we continue to see across the nation nursing homes really struggle with this uh, pandemic. Yeah, a lot of a lot of lessons learned there. Uh, one of the, one of the things that we did, and I guess the best way to put this is that uh, we converted our nursing homes into uh, community hospitals, if you will. Uh, we, uh, we beefed up the staff significantly. Uh, we had many more um, clinicians. We had infect infection control um, specialists that were uh, rounding. We separated patients wherever possible. We started testing um, our residents and our staff. Um, if, if you're non-symptomatic, you are tested um, once a week whether you're a team member, a physician, or, um, or a resident of the long-term care facility. And of course, if you are symptomatic, uh, you are, you, are um, you know, quarantined and, uh, and tested uh, repeatedly. So a lot of lessons learned there, but I, I, I am proud of, of uh, the efforts of our team at Hackensack Meridian. It, was, it wasn't perfect. We know that long-term care facilities were hit very, very hard, not just in New Jersey, but really all over the globe. And uh, but, you know, I think the fact that we were able to source and, and uh, enhance our staffing and, and isolate um, the residents where, wherever possible. And the fact that we did that universal masking early on, that just didn't apply in our hospitals, but that was also um, implemented in our nursing homes. I think that made a huge difference. But, um, you know, uh, there, there certainly were a lot of tragedies around uh, around the country and around the, uh, the world uh, with respect to. The nursing home uh, population, and, and hopefully, you know, as a as an industry, um, as a um, global community, we we, uh, we can do better going forward. 
Sure. And, and lastly, Bob, in the little bit of time we have left, I do want to pivot a little bit to sort of the financial impact that COVID has had on the industry. It's been, you know, everyone's been hard hit by it. As you said, you're in a little bit of a lull. You've got 70 patients as we speak today, COVID patients. So I imagine you're seeing a return of some of the um, elective non-emergency procedures. But can you talk a little bit about how this is going to force you to recalibrate, not just for the end of 2020, but financially going into 2021 as well? Yeah. So, you know, obviously there was a there was a huge uh, human toll uh, that that we experienced and that that many did, um, uh, but also a, a significant financial uh, toll. So uh, in terms of financial recovery, our strategy has really been um, threefold, Matt. Uh, number one, we've uh, we've focused on the uh, the CARES Act and, and the, the, the monies that were approved uh, by Congress and to be sure that we would get our our fair share because we were very, very hard hit. So that that's been a, a major focus. The second piece, as you're you're um, alluding to, is the fact that we wanted to assure the public that it was safe to come back to uh, to our hospitals, to our uh, various facilities. So we went through extraordinary uh, measures. Uh, we uh, we did um, terminal cleaning. We had it certified by outside um, agencies. Uh, we did uh, a lot of infection control um, uh, procedural upgrades. We uh, started taking temperatures at the uh, at the door. We tested all of our team members. We have thirty six thousand team members. We tested team members, we tested physicians, we test every patient that, that comes in. So we were able to get the message out, both by um, educating our physicians in terms of what we did to make our facilities safe so they could then, you know, uh, have the uh, the trust of what we did and, and translate that to their patients, but also we uh, we did also go on the airwaves. We did um, we did PSAs uh, about that it was safe to come back, and you know happy to say we're you know we're we're, we're getting there. We're not we're not all the way back, uh, but that was certainly a major strategy. And then the the third piece was an internal review. I, I would call it um, let's reimagine Hackensack Meridian Health in a in a post COVID um, environment. So we formed a, um, a senior level steer, steering committee, and we also formed a new board committee that uh, is overseeing the process. And uh, they've uh, they've identified through the steering committee they've um, they've identified ten major work streams to, you know, to improve revenue uh, in this new COVID world. Um, you know, what what do we think is going to to um, to expand? What uh, types of services and programs should we be investing in? But it also is looking at how we can make uh, Hackensack Meridian more efficient. We also are looking at our portfolio. Do we uh, do we need to change uh, some things? Do we need to own everything we own today? What might we, uh, you know, could we still achieve our mission and 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 maybe have some sort of different relationship with uh, some of the providers? So we are, we're really looking at everything. And I'm happy to say that those 10 work streams have produced 300 specific initiatives that we are now um, enacting. So this is a really active uh, process. So really threefold, it was the CARES Act. It's really assuring the public that it is safe to come back and, and getting our pre-COVID volumes back. And then uh, the third piece is kind of uh, what I would call reimagining ourselves uh, to really meet the needs uh, for the future healthcare system. Well, I think that third piece is a, a whole nother uh, checkup interview series because it sounds like you're doing some really uh, good things there. And we'd love to be able to follow up with you on, on those. It sounds um, like you've, you, you've got a clear direction on where you're headed. Absolutely. We'd love to love to share some of that information with you. Absolutely. Great. Well, Bob, listen, I, I know it's a busy time. We appreciate you taking some time out to talk to us, to share your experiences, and we'll for sure stay in touch. Uh, be safe. Thanks. Th same to you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm Matthew Weinstock with Modern Healthcare. Be sure to come back next Monday for the checkup.